Actually, we should make an announcement about the email you sent this morning. Oh, we mean about the well, the, 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 about the, the wiki, uh, pro the projects page on the wiki. Yeah, so there's a projects page on the wiki, and <laughs> I've added about four projects that I was aware of. I just added one more, and more will be added by you. So make sure if you have some project you're interested in working on this week, either a coding sprint project, design project, arithmetic geometry project, whatever, um, add something to the wiki so that when we organize into groups this afternoon, I'll be able to just go through that list. Okay. All right, so I'll start my talk. And um, one announcement, um, first just welcome to Sage Days 5, which is the first Sage Days that has a clearly focused topic, instead of being fairly general, has one specific specialty of mathematics, which is computational arithmetic geometry. Um, uh, thanks to the Clay Math Institute for fully funding this and making this um, conference possible. So thank you very much. By the way, many of the talks, as you'll see, will be fairly specialized. And if you're not a computational arithmetic geometer, feel free, or even if you are, feel free to work during the talks. So um, don't be, you know, don't, don't sort of concern yourself. I went to a conference at a conference institute once recently, and they said, no working, you know, like no touching your keyboard during a talk. Uh, and that's against the rules. And I wasn't very happy with that. So, um, so don't feel uh, so constrained. Also, there's one schedule change. I swapped my talk today with my talk on Wednesday so that Barry Mazur could be at my talk on the Sato Tate conjecture. So I'll be talking about the Birch and Swearington Dyer conjecture rather than the Sato Tate conjecture today. So, um, first, elliptic curves are projective non singular curves given by an equation like this. And there are many ways to make elliptic curves in SAGE. There are objects which are fairly well supported in SAGE. Um, you can give the 5 tuple of A invariance that defines an elliptic curve. And given a curve, you can also um, ask what's the Cremona label of the curve, which is some number like this. That will work for any elliptic curve, but it will work for curves by default up to conductor 10,000. And if you install the optional uh, Cremona database package up to uh, wherever that goes, which is over 100,000. Um, you can also make an elliptic curve given A invariance and given a Cremona label. Yep. What happens if you are over the, uh, over the limit? Well, I'll give you an error. Uh, there's various databases of elliptic curves. There's the Cremona database. So you can, uh, for example, ask for all elliptic curves in the Cremona database in some range, and it'll give you back a generator. It doesn't actually construct all the elliptic curves, but as you ask for one after the other, it will construct them. If you say list, then it actually constructs them all. So here, this is a list of a whole bunch of curves with uh, various fields filled in, such as generators for the Mordell Bay group and so on. Another database which isn't there by default um, is the Stein Watkins database. Here's an example of uh, extracting some data out of it. it um, so, what this has is a you know, million, hundreds of millions of elliptic curves that uh, Mark and I enumerated, and um, this allows you to quickly go through those curves and use them from Sage. The actual database itself is simply the exact same raw files that Mark and I created. There isn't anything more to it than that. The main thing is that there's code in Sage to parse those files and give you back um, curves efficiently. Um, so the Birch and Swearington Dyer conjecture is a conjecture about elliptic curves over number fields and um, other global fields. And it involves a whole bunch of quantities attached to an elliptic curve. These are some of the, uh, at least over Q, easy to compute quantities, some of which appear in the conjecture, not all of them. Uh, but you can compute all these very efficiently in SAGE over the rational numbers, uh, the discriminant, conductor, division polynomials. Um, I have a feeling these will get faster in the near future because of an email David Hardy wrote, which connects computing these efficiently to computing periodic heights. Um, period lattices, root numbers, and so on. So you're assuming that factorization is easy? <laughs> yeah, I mean, the, the sort of range that's... Does Sage from the quantum computing? <laughs> it's the least of our worries in this room. Yeah, I know. Yeah. No, I mean, 
you, very often in arithmetic geometry, easy means there exists an algorithm that's been implemented. Yeah. <laughs> so, or at all, actually. I mean, even there exists an algorithm almost means easy in arithmetic it's geometry. It's some open source system. Yeah, exactly. That's easy. <laughs> um, so uh, here's some examples of computing the things on the previous slide. So uh, you make an elliptic curve, factor the discriminant, factor the conductor, compute a division polynomial, compute a periodless. You'll see I put a few to-dos there, which could be um, part of a small coding sprint. I just noticed that in Sage computing the um, period lattice and real volume, currently it just gives you something to something like 100 digits of precision. And you have no control over it all, which is kind of funny because it would probably take about a half hour or two um, change things that you have very precise control over the precision. Since after all, it's computing these things using Perry, and in Perry you have very precise control over the precision. It's kind of ironic because we spent a huge amount of time making sure that the periodic analogs of these sorts of things, um, at least with regulators, you do have very precise control over the precision. And that's really, really hard. We spent like you know, weeks on that sort of thing. Which is kind of funny that for the analogous real quantity, we don't spend a, any time. I have a sage question. So is this sure. period lattice an actual lattice object? No. Okay. It's a pair, it's the, a basis okay. for the lattice. I was, I was wondering whether or not you, know, you add lattices over R. At some point, they, they will be added, but they're not there right now. There's been mumblings about it. Um, okay, so for elliptic curves over number fields, the situation isn't, uh, well, here's the situation. First stage can compute the basic invariance as above, except not the conductor, as you'll see in a minute. And you can do two descents, uh, mainly using Denise Simone's two descent program. And I'll show you an example of that in a minute. So if you have an elliptic curve over a number field, you have some hope of computing the Mordell Day group. Um, but, if you, but you can't actually even compute the conductor. You can compute the J invariant and a few other things. But functionality for elliptic curves over number fields is kind of limited. Um, in particular, Tate's algorithm, which gives you the conductor and the, re the uh, type of the reduction at each prime of that reduction, is not implemented. Fortunately, John Cremona wrote a version in Magma <coughs> that he has GPL'd. So we will port that to Sage. That's a possible project. On um, L-series computations, so we don't have fast computation of the number of points over FQ on an elliptic curve only over FP, so that needs to be implemented. It's actually mostly implemented due to, um, I think Martin, where's Martin, is he here? Yeah, so you, you give a talk in Germany to some students or something, you had to implement baby step, giant step on elliptic curves, so that's the key step, but uh, a little bit more work needs to be done in order to actually get those cardinalities efficiently. So that, that's something that we could try work on when Drew is here, which might be like tomorrow. Cool. And then once you have these numbers, you can use Dutch's search program to compute a lot about L-series so the curves over number fields. Um, and as uh, Dimitar will mention a little bit later in the week, computing this sort of thing is really important for computing Heidner points over ring class fields. So this is necessary for a certain algorithm there. Um, height bounds, so that by height bounds I mean um, bounds that bound the difference between the naive and uh, canonical height on an elliptic curve over a number field. Over Q, there's code that does that um, due to it's part of MW rank actually, so Sage gives you that. But over number fields, there isn't any code, and it is actually useful in a lot of projects. So you mean the canonical height or the the naive and canonical the height? height. The so just the standard sort of bounds that you use all the time over Q. You also need them over number fields. And John again has a program that's in G, that's a Magma script that's GPL, which computes the a bound on difference. But it's not in Sage. Mark? So, can you compute torsion for elliptic curves over number fields? No. Okay. So, that would be can, can, you, can you compute canonical heights of uh, points on elliptic curves over number fields? Nope. I'll mention that later, actually. Basically, all you can do is things like the J invariant okay. discriminant. You can add points, though. Yeah. <laughs> if you can find some, you can add them. <laughs> you can use it as C modular lattice at points. <laughs> so, well, no, I mean, you really have some block over any ring, um, or, or over any field. So here's a number field, here's an elliptic curve over that number field, um, computing its J invariant, doing a descent and finding if the curve has rank zero over that number field, and uh, computing the discriminant. So you can do a few things like this, but... Can we compute the period lattice? Over a number field? Yeah. No. Um, it wouldn't be difficult to add that functionality, but it's not implemented. Yep. That would be part of the input, and there would be some default, which chooses, uh, given any number field, there's a function complex embeddings, 
which is a list of the complex embeddings of that number field. So it would choose by default the first one, and you could explicitly ask for a different one. Why don't you just let them deal with all of them at once? You could do that too. Yeah, I mean, it should just. That's something to be discussed. So you might want to specify which ones we're getting. Yeah, or if you're just giving back all of them, then you can choose which ones. You want to know how they match up. Yeah. yeah. If, you're, if you're given the option of asking for one, then yeah. you could ask for all of them. Uh, okay, so L series for elliptic curves over Q. The situation there is very nice. There's a, quite a lot you can do in Sage. So here's some examples. Um, one of the first things is there's somewhat slow but code that gives you very precise control over computing L of one and L prime of one with provable error bounds. So that's all written in um, Python interpreted scripts. So it's not supposed to be fast, but you can say exactly how many terms of the L series you want to use, and it gives you an answer that is proven with an error bound. So it says that the value of the L function is this number, plus or minus these error bounds. And um, it's carefully done. So that's really useful for certain applications. Um, you can compute basically using dot chip search program, but you don't know that you don't have to know that. Um, the nth derivative of the L series at any point you want, which is very nice. Taylor expansions about points. Uh, you can compute, and th this is very fun, given an L series of an elliptic curve, you can compute the zeros up to, or this first n zeros in the critical strip, which will give you, a, so if you have some elliptic curve and it has some strange behavior and you're wondering why on earth does the uh, Sato Tate convergence uh, happen so quickly for this particular elliptic curve, and you're just sort of trying to make some conjecture, you're just wondering, one thing that you can very quickly look at in Sage is the zeros of the L function, the critical script, and you maybe see that for that particular curve, there's lots of low-lying zeros. Maybe there's some subtle um, analytic behavior. So it's nice to be able to just whip these out, so to speak. Um, also, Sage has a lot of code for computing chaotic L series in quite a range of different situations involving elliptic curves. It was written by me and Christian Wuffer. And finally, it has code for computing um, special values derivatives of special values and so on for, or not derivatives of special values, but special values of derivatives of symmetric power L functions attached to elliptic curves. And there's also, um, as I'll show you in a minute, a really amazing algorithm for computing modular degrees that boils down to computing these special values. I, I should point out that, the, that in number five, the S is not completely arbitrary, it's just at special points. Mm -hmm. But what you can do is you can take the information that SimPal gives you yeah. and yeah. give it back to Dobson's yes. program. Yes, Which, but that's not implemented. That would be another potentially really good project, would be to make it so you can compute using dot chip search program with um, symmetric power L functions, which yeah. is nice because then you can plug in your favorite number, any complex number, and see what the L function is at that point. Yeah, and if Mike ever does his stuff with um, um, incomplete gamma functions for higher degree L functions, that would help that will speed up too. So yes, uh, yes, nifty. Can, can you say something about the sizes of the coefficients you can work with in each of these? Um, yeah. I, I mean, if he was I annoying think that he overflowed the simple yeah. algorithm. But I think most L function algorithms, the complexity is roughly square root of the conductor. And so, I mean, if you try to stick a curve in whose conductor is around 10 to the 18th, like probably not, nothing you know, will happen. I'm, I'm talking about uh, um, uh, implementation specific bounds, like number one. There's a bound like per int, the, the size of the coefficient term. Something should be less than a per int. Yeah. So those but you couldn't even, I mean, yeah, there are what definitely bounds. Yeah, so I it think. It depends that, on your computer and you should yeah, try I think it out. That Rubenstein's so code might assume, for instance, that the conductor is a 32 bit integer. I don't know. I mean, it depends on how it's compiled. Yeah. But often, if you don't make that assumption, I mean, when it's bigger, you couldn't do it anyways because it would take too long to. Yeah, the well, that, that was always my opinion until so you tried to use my code. Did yeah. <laughs> I mean, you end up waiting forever if you. I'm going to wait. Maybe yeah. I should have a code. Maybe yeah. I should change the code so if the, if the conductor is bigger than a machine in, so none of these programs accept it, it's, it goes into an infinite loop. <laughs> Using all processing cores. <laughs> The same. The same. <laughs> the same as two and yes, two and oh, three is slightly different. Yeah. It just it's there's a standard yeah. method that yeah. for any L function you can use this. It just takes the inverse number and that one takes 
I think, I think this is a, a good topic for like a 30 minute talk during the working sessions or the evening that Mark could give, which is just about SynPal. Right, Mark? Give like a demo and talk about what it does. I could. <laughs> By popular demand, you can make it well. Let's see. Um, okay, here are some examples of bullet point one, which is computing L of one and L prime of one. Uh, the way it works is you start with an elliptic curve, you say L series at one, which is kind of getting to be an unworkable notation. There should be E dot L series, and then that has a method which would have this functionality. Uh, but back in the days when this was almost the only thing in Sage, this made a lot of sense to me. Um, so the answer, if you use 10 terms of the L series, is 0 0.7256, etc., and this is a bound on the error. So the actual value of the L series is this number plus or minus that number. Um, if you use 100 terms of the L series, you would get something that's correct all the digits that you have here, as you can see there. There's another example with the elliptic curve 37A, which has analytic rank 1. Here's the median um, term of the ulcers. And there's an error bound in each case. And the error bound is computed by um, computing, well, first let me tell you about the precision to which you're working, but mainly by computing a bound on the tail end of the sum, given the possibility. You really get exactly the same error bound for the derivative and for, and for the? I think that that's, to the precision we're yeah. working, that's just zero. Yeah, I mean, that's probably. Because it's, I mean, it's 10 to the minus 45. Okay. And you can see that. Yeah, okay. Because one uses the exponential function, one uses the exponential integral. So there's yeah. slightly different. Well, the error bound is really stupid. I mean, it's just summing the yeah. tail end of a series. Yeah. But yeah, you're right. Okay. Um, all right, so here's an example uh, using Tim Dodgetzer's program. So you just say L series Dodgetzer. There's an optional argument, which is the precision you want to work to. So if you put 100 in here, 100 bits, then things will be slower, but you'll get more digits out in your answers. But you can evaluate anywhere you want. This is a curve of analytic rank 2, so the L function vanishes at 1, at least to the precision you're working. Um, you can evaluate at any point you want, which is kind of fun. If you wonder what the value is of 1 plus i, gives it to you, it's very fast. Um, you can compute any derivative at any point, which is fun. So this is the leading coefficient. For fun, you can even compute the third, fourth, fifth derivative at 1, even though they're non-zero. There's nothing that stops you from doing that. You can even compute the Taylor series. So this goes on for a while. It's kind of neat to see the Taylor series. Uh, so it's 0 plus 0 times z plus something times z squared and so on. And is there a way of setting how many terms in the Taylor series? Yeah. yeah. One. And you can, this is fun, this is a Taylor series about i, which is kind of neat to see. Wait, so the Taylor series around 1, the output seems to say Taylor series around 0. Is that intentional? No, the variable is in terms of s minus this. Oh, I see. Because the output is, uh, I think, a power series, and power series in Sage don't, you know, they don't print it. Yeah. So this is set as much the same for set L L series one comma two to the two terms and so forth. I believe so. Yes. Yeah. Um, so you really want to see it. Let's see. So it's the curve three eighty nine A. It might take a while since I haven't started Sage yet, and I just booted up my computer. There it is. Okay. Um, so L equals E dot L series dot chip series. <laughs> and then L dot Taylor series. And you can see what the options are. So the point about which you're doing the expansion, and I think K is the number of terms of the expansion. So about I to say four terms, uh, there's what you get right there. So you can see it's something plus something times Z plus something times Z squared and so on. Okay? So if you think that you can somehow cleverly interpret um, some type leading motivic conjecture in terms of Taylor series about some funny complex number, here's your chance. Uh, here's an example of just drawing a plot of a complex L series. This is the real, the L series restricted to the interval from zero to three on the real line. So you have these nice pretty functions. How long would that take to? Uh, probably about 15, 10 or 15 seconds. Yeah, it's not ridiculously long. Um, this is interestingly significantly faster than just say using Perry's L series command, L, L series. Um, if you want to make it a bit faster, you can, it really doesn't hurt for a picture, you can reduce the precision. Because you know, computing every term to 20 or so digits of precision is ridiculous if you're drawing a picture. Um, you only need it to like two or three terms to get an accurate picture. Is there any way to exploit the fact that it's full function? So if you know it's valid, then you'd rather uh, yeah, 
the line, there's an interpol, there's a, a command that allows you to get some points and it smoothly interpolates between them. Then you can plot the result of that. Um, this, the plot command by default does do some adapter refinement, so it'll, uh, it'll compute more values around here, you know, just because it, the derivative is big, so um, it takes extra time because of that. What takes a long time is computing this graph in three-dimensional space. So you evaluate it a lot of points. Um, uh, here's an example of computing the zeros. So take our elliptic curve of rank two, and then compute the first 20 zeros um, in the critical strip. So these are the imaginary, or you know, the coefficient of i in 1 half plus y i for each of the zeros. You can see there's a zero of order two at s equal to one, because it's a curve of analytic rank two, and then you have the next um, 18 zeros. And you can see the total time to do the calculation is less than a second. So it's not that long. And then we can draw a graph of this using the list plot command. And there you are. So these are the first 20 zeros of the L function of the elliptic curve. So, yes? Can you check the x coordinate, the real part? Yeah, it, it does. Yes. So it will yeah. give a big leap if it's yeah. not on the line. Yeah, your room sense code are not because it's Yeah. Anyway, the zeros should have been a part of one, one half. Oh, sorry, I said, uh, it's the, okay, so, so first, note that the, the, the quick answer is analytic number theorists normalize yeah. differently, so I'm doing Because that. Mike's an analytic but, number theorist. Uh, and <laughs> yeah, but actually, if you look at the output, there's no um, imaginary, there's no real part at all. It's just the imaginary parts, and then I plotted it this way because for some reason, whenever I start thinking about Mike's code, I start thinking about things with their normalization, so that's why. Um, uh, the only reason it's a half is because I put a half here instead of one. I should have done it. So that's what they were just discussing. It, um, no, no, the I function mean, will I mean, give a big error message. Yeah, I mean, it's false. it uses some sort of Turing test to show that it's found all um, um, all the zeros up to a given point. Um, it's it's, it's a test due, 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 due to Turing, which gets explicit bounds for the number of zeros up to a given point. He just did the Riemann zeta function. So once, it's so it's not that Turing test. Yeah. 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 So yeah. <laughs> <laughs> your own function cannot be distinguished from a person. Yeah. <laughs> 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 not yet passing. Right? <laughs> <laughs> so okay. Uh, here's an example of computing a periodic L series. So take a, the elliptic curve 37 a of rank one. Let L be the climatic L series. And then there's a sequence of um, polynomial approximations, or, yeah. There are a sequence of polynomial approximations to the piatic L series. So the piatic L series itself is really a formal power series with coefficients in Zp here, but um, you see just one of the approximations. So as you increase this number, it takes longer and longer to compute these approximations. Um, but the fifth one is right here. And this probably. I don't know how long this takes, maybe it's two or three seconds or something. Uh, so here it is. And uh, one key thing is every digit in the output is actually correct. So if a digit's there, then it really is that. So if you increase the precision, you'll get a new L series so that the digits match up. And that was uh, surprisingly hard to get right because basically the error bounds that uh, Rob Pollack sort of wrote down when we asked them, weren't quite right when we tried, and then we had to correctly prove things, and we had a lot of emails that went back and forth, and we actually nailed down what all the correct error bounds are. And for various reasons, we uh, implemented computing periodic L series in a wide range of cases, so it's not just for good ordinary primes. Um, so for super singular primes, um, there it's interesting because you end up having a power series that's not over ZP, There's a, so for a quadratic extension where it would be nice to have extensions of piatic so that I could represent the elements not using just a quotient polynomial ring, which is what we currently do. Um, so let's see, bad reduction. There's no bad additive reduction yet, because I don't know how to define the whole series there. Uh, this is not great if you need very high precision. And there's an algorithm of uh, Robert Pollack and Glenn Stevens that involves uh, a piatic analog of modular symbols, which allows you to compute piatic L series to very high precision. And that's not implemented in Sage. I don't know if it's available in anywhere. They told me they have bits and pieces of magma code that can do it in some cases. So I think that's the situation with that. Um, I think it would be very nice if it were to get implemented in Sage. Uh, 
And these, these theories are very useful for applications to the BSD conjecture because when you compute one, you can see an upper bound on the order of vanishing, and a theorem of Cotto gives you uh, that the, uh, well, the algebra, it gives you bounds that relate the algebraic rank of the curve, the order of the Schaffer HT group of P, and so on, to the order of vanishing of the series. So you get a lot of information from the order of vanishing of the series, and also the leading term. It's a bound, it's a divisibility. And actually, it's getting to be an equality slowly but surely because of uh, um, Chris Skinner's work on and Urban's work on the main conjecture of Iwasawa theory, which is my understanding doing very well. Um, here's an example of computing with symmetric power L functions, which, as you can see, clearly isn't so well developed currently. Um, so you can create an elliptic curve. The first time you do a calculation, you have to run this command to pre-compute certain data. That should actually happen automatically, but it doesn't yet. Mm -hmm. So um, there's a, definitely a coding sprint project to improve the Sage interface to Mark's program so that you can just ask for what you want and it gives you the answer without having to you know, do funny things along the way. So this pre-computes some data and stores it in some temporary place, or hopefully permanent place, actually. Um, and interestingly, I guess, from a programming point of view, I, I guess this data would have to be stored once for each user. So that's a little annoying because it, you can't assume that you can write to the stage root directory. In any case, here's an example of computing uh, the second symmetric power uh, to, 16 digits to 16 digits of precision. What so I think that's a special value of one. What does it do in new data for? What? Like you say, sim how new data. Um, to, it, it, yeah, this right here. For it every symmetric data. power, it has to pre compute some data. So he's just computing something yeah. for a second symmetric power. It, it takes like a minute I, or so. I, and you only have to do it once. So yeah. if, you, if you replace the two with a three, it will be for Yeah, two, but, but then you have to be more tricky because for third powers, you might care about derivatives. So you can compute the zero derivative first group. Okay. So. I mean, these are completely generic. Yeah, and notice that E is not involved anywhere. So once you do this once, you don't have to do it again. Um, I've done, I think, 18. <laughs> yeah. So I mean, this program very. Oh, no, no, I know. It'd be 18 symmetric power. So, so unless you're empty, this program seems incredibly yeah, powerful. I mean, you can bring those up to four or five. Yeah. So and it should come with the analytic rank and modular degree step already there, so you shouldn't have to do the same power command for the first and symmetric. The first and second symmetric power mm. at least a low precision. Mm. So. For some reason, you have to do the second one. But we can talk about this. But I mean, symmetric powers of elliptic curve L functions are all the rage these days, so it's nice <laughs> that this program exists. I mean, like the work of Taylor on Sato tape involves establishing properties of these L functions. Yeah, it was annoying because when we wrote the paper, it's like, you know, well, we give evidence that the, you know, that these <laughs> things are actually, you know, they satisfy functional equations, and then, like, the time it was accepted, the time it was published, Taylor proved it. Right. <laughs> yeah, but I think. Okay, so um, you can also compute modular degrees, which is pretty amazing. Behind the scenes, this is using SimPow. Um, so, you can take, say, this elliptic curve, the first one of rank three, and it computes the funny 1984 modular degree very quickly, and this is just over. Basically, it's instantaneous. Um, here's an example of the first curve of rank five, which has conductor 19,047,851. And actually, when I met Mark Watson, this is in like 1997 at the Arizona Winter School, he was specifically wondering how to compute the modular degree of this curve, because it was very relevant to his thesis, which was on um, the class number problem for quadratic imaginary fields. And using all algorithms that we could think of at the time, it was completely out of, out of uh, range to compute the modular degree of this curve. Well, no, except no, no, if no code that almost worked. If you're known, it was almost possible. <laughs> yeah. It didn't quite, didn't quite work. Um, using the method of graphs, you can do some crazy linear algebra in a space of very large dimension. Um, maybe get it, but it didn't end up working, did it? Or, you know, uh, for this 19 million. I never did that computation. Yeah. Anyway, I did one it, for about half a minute. Yeah, I think you 
you try to convince us that it's possible. But in Sage now, you can just type, ask for the modular degree, and in nearly three minutes, a little over three minutes, you get the answer, which is this number right here. So it's, it's pretty extraordinary. And the reason that it's so fast is because there's a nice algorithm that involves symmetric power L functions for computing modular degrees. There is an assumption about the Manning constant. Yeah? Why is there such a huge difference in the CPU time and the wall time? Because it's uh, calling out to SimPow, which is an external program. So the wall time is what you should look at primarily in this case. The CPU time measures the CPU time used by the Sage process itself. It doesn't measure the time by other programs that Sage calls. Oh, I see. So SimPow is a separate program. There's no C library link between Sage itself and SimPow. So what happens for this calculation is it starts up the command line program SimPow, which starts very quickly because it's a very lightweight program with some options. And one of the options say compute with this elliptic curve, compute this information. It gets the output after 207 seconds with um, this sort of overhead for actually starting the program up and stopping it. And then it reads the modular degree out and gives you back the answer as a stage integer. Okay. Have you tried um, looking at the CPU times for child processes, which should be available to get an accurate uh, CPU the time? The timers, uh, it doesn't do children forget our usage. But one could work on that because you know what all the children processes are. So in theory, that should be possible. Um, good project for you. Yeah. I think it would be very nice to have um, something that also summarizes CPU time, the sum of CPU times for all child project pro processes, or even you know, so gives it for each child process. That would be a wonderful thing to add. Yes, MT. What What does words best algorithm mean? <laughs> I know. <laughs> Um, yeah, so I several agree. people starting with uh, uh, Zagier, Zagier and then Cremona. Is, yeah, I mean, Zagier's is actually better in some cases if you have not a, this case. If you have a whole bunch of memory, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you should be able to use some FFT thing here, and you know, but know. it's by far the best algorithm that I've ever heard of. It's, it's, that. Well, it's, it's fast. <laughs> The other algorithms exactly would take forever. How's that? A surface like ridiculous. I mean, okay. So there's some topological thing that's, that's in this paper. So there's also a, um, John Cremona has an algorithm that involves modular symbols, which I mean, do you want to compute a space of modular symbols of dimension, you know, one million? No. So, so we Uh, so computing more LA groups, here's the situation. So first, Cremona's a uh, very, very um, often used, nicely refined, stable, and, and uh, powerful program, MW rank is in Sage. And it's you can use it, it gets used either as an external process or there's a direct C library linked to it. So um, the support for using MW rank from Sage is very good. Also, Denise Simon's program for algebraic two descents in Sage, and since John Cremona started using Sage a lot lately, uh, he was the number two poster on Sage Devel last month. Were <laughs> uh, you or Mike number one? I was. I'm always number one for some reason. I, uh, so the number two spot kind of varies around. Once it was Timothy Clements for a while, and, but last last month it was uh, John Cremona. So he. He's been, he had a bunch of things that he wanted Denise Simone to do, and he just sent me an email today saying that Denise says he's now implementing all these things. So I think that this program will improve significantly in the near future. Um, Mark, you gave a really nice talk uh, I saw last year on kind of the relations between these two programs. Do you want to say a word? I would be appreciated. When did I talk about these last year? <laughs> in San Diego. It was a year before okay, last year. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, my visit in San Diego. Um, yeah. Cremonis works well when the discriminants is. Niels would know more about the algebraic tools. Okay, say something. <laughs> uh, so, well, this, I had a question about it. That, <laughs> this, it. It doesn't actually export the, the two summer group in some usable form? No. It, it really Coding spread project. Yeah. <laughs> All you have to do is know Paris, Sage, and Little French. <laughs> oh, <laughs> <laughs> Um, and as I mentioned in the, I showed you an example earlier, this also works over number fields. Uh, Robert Gratch wrote a wrapper that was working over number fields. And uh, Magma has more methods for computing more Del Bay groups of elliptic curves than this. So Magma has 
a very powerful uh, optimized implementation of the Heater points method that Mark completely wrote or mostly wrote. Um, I well, Tom Lomack well, well, took something of Cremona's, wrote it in Magma, and then I completely rewrote it in Magma. Okay, good. So uh, Mark rewrote it, and it's pretty good, right? It's, it's is, it, good. is it the best implementation there is? Cremona thinks it is. I mean, Cremona has his own Pari version of the data points method that's okay. maybe 10 times slower. I'll humble it. Okay. Another, yeah. um, Magma has also uh, to a certain extent uh, over algebraic number fields, which is useful. Which is useful every now and again. Right. Uh, Especially okay. for so that should also be listed here. And I think Mark, you told me they can do twelve descent. Like Six, eight, eight, and twelve percent. Eight. Yeah, so. I just got an email from Steve Donnelly saying that it works better than he thought it was going to be. He's wow. taking Sebastian's descent. Yeah. Care. So basically, um, in Magma, things like higher descent have been pushed. Absolutely farther forward than in the yeah, but free world. My understanding is once you have, um, say, two and three descent, six yep. descent is rather easy to do. Uh -huh. than use, it was just a theoretical problem more than an implementation problem. For, for me personally, I'm very interested in the rank of the three Selmer group, the rank of the four Selmer group for applications to BSD. Because I want to know, say, you have an elliptic curve with Shaw that's non trivial, the two Shaw is non trivial, I want to know that there's no four Shaw. Mm -hmm. um, I want to know that there's no three Shaw in particular cases which doesn't require doing all the descent, just computing the rank of the summer group. But uh, that's the first thing I would like to see. And then also it's such a if I want to find the for a while. Yeah, I mean, well, yeah. Yeah, you can do I guess they do secret system. research on Shaw. Differential equations. Okay, so here's some specific examples with some sort of random curves. Uh, this uses MW rank by default, so that's what's being used behind the scenes here. So MW rank for, you know, for a lot of small curves is very fast. Um, here's another example using MW rank. Basically what it does is it runs one MW rank process, gets the answer, and then parses the output. That's what you're saying. What? It's just the um, A4 and A6 for a little bit. Oh. Yeah, y squared equals x cubed plus 12x plus 2007. It's just at pretty much at random. Um, and then here's the same one done with Simmons group, which takes a little longer in that case. Uh, regulators, so of course you can compute classical regulators. But amusingly, the um, code in Sage doesn't allow you to specify the precision. So it's always to like you know some number of digits, and that's it. That should be easy to fix, because in Perry, which is, I think, doing the calculation, either Perry or MW rank. Certainly in Perry, you could get this to whatever precision you want. So this is just. Um, Literally, probably adding a few lines of code to call the appropriate Perry function with the precision set in a certain way. So, an easy project. Um, as I mentioned earlier in response to Mark's question, Sage does not have functionality for computing either heights or, of course, regulators over number fields yet. Because uh, I think Perry doesn't do that. And I mean, how hard could that be, though, actually? It's probably easy to implement. Yeah. I mean, like the definitions. Yeah. So. Well, actually, there's all kinds of tricks that aren't there to make it fast. But even then, it's not that. For regular? No, just heights of a point. A regular is hard because you need the Mortal Day group. Um, so we don't even know if that's possible. But, um, but the height definitely shouldn't be not that. Uh, um, for periodic heights and regulators over Q, Sage has a lot of functionality. You did David Harvey and me, Brad, Robert Badshai, Jerome Kedlaya, uh, Mazer, and Tate. And this is very valuable for um, periodic analogs of the BSD conjecture. And there's so much uh, amazing theoretical work towards periodic analogs of the BSD conjecture that you can often, as I'll show you in a minute, use these analogs plus computation of periodic regulators and periodic L functions to um, compute, say, the P part of Shaw for P sum prime for which you could never hope to do a P descent. Um, we don't have periodic heights over a number of fields, which is kind of ridiculous because I mean, I first started talking about periodic heights with Jerry Mazur like four years ago, specifically for computing periodic heights over number fields to get some data related to some work he was doing with Carl Rubin. And then we ended up making periodic heights over Q faster. And even still now, there's nothing in Sage for doing them over number fields. Is there, are there theoretical things to be straightened out yeah. first? Yeah, uh, I don't think it's that Do we actually bad. know how to, how, to, yeah. how to do this in principle? Yeah. And even that Chinese student appears at MIT. Yes. That was his project last summer. Oh, for the for for quadratic. Yeah, at the very last day of the workshop, when I was about to go to the airport, he had his laptop in his hand. He said, I did it. 
And so I don't know what the situation is. Oh, yeah, I, 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 can, I can ask him. Uh, David, as well. I haven't followed it up with him, but um, I, I've been working on that with Barry now for a very field. Awesome. There's, there's some wrong minus signs in that paper. Not surprising. That, I mean, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, they have conflicting minus signs in the references in various Mesa tape papers. But yeah. We're sure this is Conrad when we need it. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so here are some examples, just computing a classical regulator, uh, computing a piatic regulator, so this is pretty neat. And just to impress you, um, it takes like a half second to compute the piatic regulator, fairly high precision from my point of view, for P equals 997 for this curve of rank 2. And this is really amazing to me, um, because when I implemented the first much, so just to give you a sense of this, the situation here, uh, about four years ago, if you used the best algorithms known, this would be a very, very hard calculation, and this would be completely impossible. Um, it would take years. Uh, actually, I mean, as soon as P got to be above 10 or so, it would just take a ridiculously long amount of time. And then uh, Maser Tate and I came up with a better algorithm, which could do this in maybe five, you know, a few minutes, uh, but could never, ever, you know, in a reasonable amount of time, do this. And now you can compute for the next prime after 100,000 the chaotic regulator to precision 10 in under five seconds. Actually, it's, it's all CPU time, so under four seconds. So this is pretty amazing. It's really useful for certain. So uh, uh, second credit, for credit due for that's David Harvey. Yes, this this is due all to David Harvey, uh, greatly, vastly improving the uh, algorithm that we came up with initially, um, and he's constantly improving it. For example, yesterday he sent this really long email, with some clever idea that eliminates all the um, stuff involving differential equations and power series and so on from. The algorithm, which is pretty cool. So in the second example here, you ask for precision 10, and you get bigger of 5 yeah, to the 8th? that happens sometimes. The precision um, sometimes drops, and yeah, I think it has to do with normalization, right? I think I've patched up for that reason. I've been working for a while, and I yeah. think I, well, yeah. I mean, it, it's, the, the these are all correct digits, but yeah, because yeah. you've got this matrix, and yeah, right. funny things can happen, but yeah. It should, the, the digits that are here are correct. Uh, in most cases, the precision is right. But does it yep. mean to a number of exclamation points? <laughs> no. That's just me jumping up and down. Wow. This is amazing. Oh, yeah. OK. Since my talk is about the virtual instruments in architecture, maybe I'll mention it. <laughs> so here's a conjecture. It says the rank of the Mordell Bay group equals the order of vanishing at 1. And um, it also says, much more importantly for this talk, that the leading coefficient of the L function at 1 is equal to this formula, the product of the Tamagawa numbers of the curve. This is another easy to compute quantity, which I actually didn't even mention. Before, times the regulator, times the real volume, or real period, um, times the order of the Shapley Rich Tate group, first time I really explicitly mentioned that, divided by the order of the torsion subgroup squared. So that's the conjecture. It's the uh, million dollar Clay Prize from the Clay Institute. At least this is. Actually, I don't need to prove this. All I have to do is prove this. <laughs> All of them. And uh, this conjecture on the top is a theorem when the order of vanishing is either 0 or 1, due to Gross, Zagier, Kolleybing, and um, So there are piatic analogs of both of these conjectures due to Maser, Tate, and Teitelbaum, which really kind of fall out naturally from uh, Iwasawa theory and are generalized in Iwasawa theory. Uh, or at least the approaches to proving them involve a lot of Iwasawa theory. And um, a lot of the theorems towards the PI versions are due to Kato, and many other people. So a huge area of research that many people in this room are interested in. So um, if you look at the conjecture, every quantity in here is, quote, easy to compute, except the order of the Schaffer-Rich team. When I, I say quotes because the regulator, we don't you know, know an algorithm for sure to compute it, but in practice for Say every curve in Kerman's book, you can essentially instantaneously compute the, all the other quantities here except the order of the Schaffer H group. Um, so, the name of the game, if you want to verify for a particular curve or do some computation related to the DSD conjecture, or to verify, I guess, to verifying it, is um, what you do is you compute what the conjecture says this number should be, and then you try to prove that, in fact, the Schaffer H group has that claimed order. And Sage has a lot of tools for doing that sort of thing, as I'll show you. Um, so one thing you could do, which is pretty straightforward, is just 
ask Sage for the predicted order, and you'll get a number. Another thing you can do is ask for the order predicted by um, P out of PSD, which they should be the same numbers, but there's no guarantee at all that they, that they are. Um, so you can write down all the quantities involved in a p-adic analog of BSD for a given prime p, then solve for the order of the Schaffer H tape group and get some number. The neat thing, though, is that in many, many cases under very mild hypotheses that you can verify, you know that the order predicted by p-adic BSD is up to a p-adic unit equal to the actual order of Schaff. So um, you could do a calculation here and discover that, for example, the Schaffer H tape group has no p-torsion in it, or it has p-torsion in it in some cases. Usually it's best for, usually what you do is a divisibility, so it's best for showing that Shaw doesn't have any elements. So here's a specific example. Take the rank 2 elliptic curve 389A. This curve has rank 2, and in fact, nobody has ever computed the order of the Schaffer H take group of this curve. Um, you can compute the analytic order, that is the order that ESD predicts, and it's 1.00000. We don't actually know that this is an integer, um, because if you look at what you're doing when you compute this conjectural order, you're dividing one probably transcendental number by another one, and there's no theorem that says that that quotient is even a rational number. Um, so you can compute it, and it should it looks like it's one. So let's just assume that it is, and then the question is to prove that the order of shot really is one. That's kind of hopeless at present because we don't even know that the shot average take group is finite. So then you can relax yourself a little and say, okay, well. Maybe we can prove um, that there's no p torsion in a Schaffer H tape group for some large number of primes p. So, um, what this does is it computes what the five adic analog of the BSD conjecture says that the order of Shaw should be as a p adic number. It says it should be 1 plus O of 5 squared, meaning up to precision 5 squared, it's conjecturally 1, just like we have here. And uh, likewise, in each case, when you choose a prime p, you find that the conjecture says this. And in the um, course of computing this number right here, the, um, there's very, there are various statements that are verified which tell you that the true order of Shaw divides the conjectural order of Shaw at p. So in each of these cases, you can make a conclusion, which is quite interesting, say in the case of 97, in 45 seconds, it does all calculations necessary to see that the 97 torsion in the Schaffer H state group has order one. So, I mean, you still have that plus big of 97 there. So what you get is that the true order of Shaw, or at least of the 90, so the conclusion from this calculation, if you look at what it's doing in the documentation, is that the, um, 97 component of the Schaffer H tape group is finite. And you get that actually just from verifying that the order of vanishing of the 97 attic L function is 2. Once you have that, then um, all the other quantities like the 97 attic regulator are computed. And that allows you to verify that the true order of Shaw is um, 1 times a 97 attic unit. So it's a 90, it's it's this times a 97 attic unit. In other words, it isn't divisible by 97. The true order of Shaw divides the conjectural order of Shaw at 97, and the conjectural order is 1. This number isn't divisible by 97, therefore, that isn't either. Yeah, so in general, as soon as you distinguish this number from 0, you have yeah. the yeah. order of the, exactly. the 97 mm -hmm. part. Yes. Uh, yes. Uh, well, you can't use this argument to prove that there is 97 order in Sha, if, if there would be, right? You can in situations where more has been done towards okay. proving the main conjecture of USA theory. If the main conjecture for elliptic curves were true for that particular curve, then this would allow you to deduce the existence of 97 torsion okay. if it were there. So and is this is a very... Is that rank 0 and 1 or something like no, that? No, there's nothing about, about the rank, rank actually. Rank 2 here. Yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, sure. no, but yeah. There's an amazing amount of work towards okay. the main conjecture right now. So I think that this is a promise, a very promising technique, even for that purpose. Yeah. Uh, so the, the very last thing I'm going to do, there are theorems of Kolyavik and Inclado that involve uh, Higner prime Euler system and K2 Euler systems. And they can be applied directly over Q when the analytic rank of the curve is 0 or 1. They give you an explicit computable upper bound on the Schaffer H take group. Kato only applies in the case of rank 0. And um, you can very, basically you can compute with just one command the explicit upper bound on the Schaffer H take group given by Kali-Vagan's conjecture or Kato's conjecture. 
Um, but these are examples of some of the things that you compute along the way in order to apply this theorem. Uh, so discriminants that satisfy the Higner hypothesis, that's pretty easy, it's just quadratic reciprocity. Um, you can compute the index of the Higner subgroup in the Wardell Bay group of the curve over a quadratic imaginary field. You can also compute a bound on that index without actually computing the um, Higner subgroup or the Wardell Bay group, which can be really useful in practice. So you can do some really neat things here that involve point searches. And again, it's just one command we use. You can tell for which primes the mod p representation is insurjective, and you can tell whether or not for a given prime the mod p representation is irreducible. You can also compute isogenies and so on. Uh, so here's an example of applying Cauley-Vegan's theorem, and then my last slide, which will be the next slide, will be an example of applying Cauley's theorem. So let's take the elliptic curve of rank 137a, and let's prove the full virgins rent and diary projection for that elliptic curve. So, so um, the analytic order of Shaw, you know, is exactly one because you do know that L1 over, or L prime of 1 over omega times the regulator is a rational number by the gross side gate theorem. The analytic rank is one, the order of vanishing L function is one. These are the first 10 discriminants that satisfy the Higner hypothesis, and I'm excluding three and four. Um, here's the index of the Higner subgroup in the Mordell Bay group corresponding to Q adjoint group minus seven. And it returns the answer as a provably correct interval. So the actual index is an integer that lies in this interval. Can anybody tell me what it is? <laughs> so you know what it is, it's one. Um, it, can, it tells you for which primes p the mod p representation is not surjective. In this case, the curve is isolated in its isogeny class. It has square-free conductor, so you know automatically that there aren't any. But in general, this can be a somewhat tricky calculation that uses Sarah's paper and some work of uh, Connie and Koji Carter. Um, and, and so on. Uh, this gives you a bound computed using, notice I didn't need anything from before, you just used this command. It gives you a bound on the primes that can divide the Shafrevich take group. Um, so only two can divide the Shafrevich take group according to Polyvagin's theorem. Um, and this one tells you the index of the Huebner subgroup, which I already computed, and the full group of rational points. Um, this command, two cylinder Shaw bound, uses MW rank to compute an upper bound in the rank of the two Shaw, which is zero, and hence you know there's no two Shaw. So Colley Vagan tells us that there's no Shaw order co-prime to two. General theorem tells us the Shaw Fairwich take group is finite, but in particular there's nothing of order co-prime to two, and there's nothing of order two. Therefore the Shaw Fairwich take group has order one, which is exactly what this says. So we know the BSD conjecture is true for 37A. So this Next to last comment. So only two divides Shaw. This is somewhat yeah. confusing. I should say that only two could possibly divide Shaw. Yes, thank you. I didn't I couldn't quite fit it in on the slide, but you're right. You're absolutely right. So the BSD conjecture is true for that curve. Now let's take 37B, the other curve up to isogeny of conductor 37. Um, it has analytic rank zero. It has rational three torsion. If you use Cotto's theorem, it tells you that uh, the only primes that could divide Shaw are two and three. Uh, you can quickly show that two doesn't divide the order of Shaw using the two Selmer bound. You can try to compute the three Selmer rank. Um, there's no implementation of the stage of this, but this will call magma if you have it on your computer and try to compute it. It turns out there's rational three torsion and the three Selmer rank command um, that I know of in magma, correct me if there's a better one, uh, it doesn't actually work in the case when there's rational three torsion or when the mod three representations are too similar. So this fails. Fortunately, Christian what the record? Oh, comment? Okay. So unfortunately, um, Christian Wethwick generalized, much to many people's surprise, Cotto's theorem. Cotto assumes the chaotic representation is surjective. Wethwick assumes that it's reducible. So as long as it's not. <laughs> in the middle of those two possibilities. So if it's reducible, you can apply Wethrick, and you do get a three doesn't divide the order of shock. So in fact, for um, 37b, the Birchens, Wernt, and Dyer conjecture is also true. So J0 of 37, the Jacobian of X0 of 37, is just isogenous to a product of these two curves. BSD is isogeny invariant, so BSD is true for J0 of 37. So this is just an example of how you can apply some of these techniques. And in these cases, uh, we didn't need any chaotic methods to conclude anything, but um, in some cases when, say, the curve has a big Tamagawa number, or a prime that divides several Tamagawa numbers, you um, have to use chaotic methods, even in the case of rank zero and one, because the Kali Vagan, and in some cases Kato bound, isn't strong enough. So if you have a rank one curve 
with big Tamagawa numbers for which Dimitar's result doesn't apply. You, can't, you have to use uh, PI methods. But in many cases, even if there are Tamagawa numbers, you can deal with that. The problem is just that the index of the, basically the quality eigenbound isn't good enough in some cases when you have Tamagawa numbers. But the quality eigen Dimitar bound is. So, in some cases. What? Yeah, but since he's in the room. <laughs> Um, so that's the end of my talk. Any questions or comments? So I have a question. So those, yep. those computations for those specific curves. Um, like that? Yeah, like that, for example. So all those steps in the computation, is that the, would they be difficult to do by hand? Is, is it like out of the range of a person to sit down and just walk through it? Uh, that's a good question. So the, um, no, probably, in fact, let's see, I wish, I would, I, I bet you, I mean, this one doesn't work, so um, that's excluded. I bet you that, in fact, the calculations I list here have been done by hand, because this X not of 37 has been so well studied from the point of view of these particular um, calculations by Zaki. He has a paper where he does a lot of things, probably, I mean, partic I guess by hand, um, for this particular situation. Well, just because he can do it by hand doesn't yeah. really <laughs> So I suspect that someone like Zagier or Lenster could do this particular thing by hand. If you make the curve more complicated, it gets a lot harder. If the conductor is larger, I and mean, you have to approximate the L-series to sufficient precision to you know, you can compute the analytic order of shot, and that gets to be incredibly tedious by hand. I mean, do you really want to sum a thousand terms of a numerical series by hand? Um, and, and likewise, well, I mean, you need that in order to execute the, in, you have to find the Heegner point. So that's an additional work. You need to, you need to saturate the Mordell Bay group. Um, I don't know how you do that by hand. You'd reduce the point mod primes and, and stuff. So, but I, I'm pretty sure that you could do all of what I just listed in these two slides by hand. Of course, you know that uh, you could comment on doing this by hand. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so any other um, comments or questions? Uh, Nils? Yeah, this is more, 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 more general arithmetic geometry question. Uh, how far is, is Sage for basically having support for something like playing curves and function fields for playing curves? Divisor arithmetic on function fields of curves? Um, That's what Macaulay or something. Or something. Yeah. Yeah, that, that's what I'm thinking. Can, can we actually interface something like that? There's certainly uh, some, there's a lot that, there is a lot that Singular offers along those lines, some of which Sage wraps, especially in the case of a finite field. Oh. Um, but I'm not at all prepared to, <laughs> to correctly answer that question at the moment. So, um, but if, if I were giving an overview survey of arithmetic geometry in Sage, I would say that the um, computations you just or asked for are definitely a weak point that needs to be greatly improved. Yeah. Especially function, like doing things like class groups of function field computing yeah. with them. Um, the sort of thing that Florian Hess wrote in Magma, I don't think it's really done anywhere else. So. Or so, plus, I mean, if you are given a large degree genus one plane curve yeah. with a rational point on it. Yeah. Right, with the curve? Yeah. <laughs> so uh, Sage, has a, <laughs> Sage yeah. has a command when it's a cubic, it calls Magma. Um, I have a student who is doing his project for this quarter on turning genus one curves of the rational point into a Weierstrass okay. form. So that's his, his student project for the quarter, Bobby Moretti, the guy that wrote the calculus package and Sage is working on that now. So that will be addressed, or that is being addressed right now. Is he doing it by a Riemann-Roch basis? Or? Well, he's starting with the case of a cubic, which is actually written right, down in yeah. Cohen's book, yeah. step by step. Yeah. Um, I don't know what he's going to do in general. Actually, or how general you do, do it. Even if you have the general uh, thing, you still want to have those special cases. The yeah. Insertion of two quarters. Yep. Yeah. Mac so yeah. To yeah. 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 So yeah. that's what he's starting with. Yeah. Um, and we'll see where it goes. So. Yeah. Any ideas, please send them my way. Okay. Any other questions? Okay. Thanks. Why don't we start the next talk uh, by David Rowe and uh, 1035.
Oh, one other announcement. If people would kindly not do anything important using the wireless network, I'm going to remove the password uh, uh, protection so that everybody can just oh, thank you. get on. That's very nice. Oh, cool. yeah. oh, man, I could do this. Do what? Full screen does work. Yeah. 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 Uh, you still compare the work to be um, theoretical. I mean, there are other algorithms for doing this. Yeah, that's what my yeah. last two s or my last four slides were basically about. I mean, like right, I computed yeah, the ninety-seven yeah. torsion. Sure. Or do you yeah. mean directly computing it in some sense, like actually doing explicit computations in Galois cohomology? You don't mean yeah. that. Surely you don't mean that. Oh right. Because well, no one would ever do that. Okay. Uh, yeah.